Hello everyone and welcome back to the Springer Nature Black Employee Network Speaker Series. I'm Devin Williams and today for our fourth installment of the series, I'm joined by Professor Anthony Ryan Hatch from Wesleyan University. So to start off, I'd like to ask how long have you been working at Wesleyan University and what is your role and responsibilities? So I arrived at Wesleyan in the fall of 2015 and now I serve as the chair and I'm an associate professor of science and society at Wesleyan University. In your experience, what would you say your three most gratifying accomplishments are? Uh, my two books stand out for me. Um, I didn't realize I would be a book writer, that I would have things to say that I could share with readers. Um, my book, Blood Sugar, began as my dissertation and then has really opened me up to a whole new world of thinking about environment and health, and then the work on silent cells as well. Um, I would say, thirdly, professionally, the thing I'm most proud of is, is my teaching and my relationship to my students. Um, since I was a graduate student, you know, I have loved the art and craft of teaching, of designing a syllabus, of building a narrative, of connecting with my students and showing them as much empathy and grace as I have been shown as a student. What was your experience in diversity and inclusion in STEM when you started your career in comparison to now? I got my PhD in sociology at the University of Maryland in College Park. I was fortunate enough to be accepted into the American Sociological Association's Minority Fellowship Program. And this was a pre-doctoral fellowship designed to identify young scholars of color, specifically black scholars at the time, uh, principally who were um, doing work on mental health and inequality that uh, needed support. I've also been able to benefit from a, an NIMH postdoc at the Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta when I f first started my academic career at Georgia State in 2009. And then later I was part of what was called the Summer Research Institute of the Racial Democracy Crime and Justice Network, which was based at Ohio State University. And you know, I benefited from these kinds of mentoring programs over the years enormously. And um, you know, those efforts are ongoing. You know, when you're dealing with an institutional structure like glo kind of global science, um, you know, it's it is um, one of its core features is that it has been a racial structure, right? When you look at who occupies the positions around the world, there's a clear racial hierarchy involved, and that's been the case for a while. Do you feel the conversation on race and STEM has been a priority in academia? It's a good question. I think that, um, you know, taking, for example, my colleagues here at Wesleyan um, as one small case study, you know, my colleagues in the sciences are absolutely thinking about how they can support their students of color who come through their courses. The response uh, that I've seen here isn't mirrored everywhere. The same racial structures that exist within the broader society are also replicated within science, right? Science is not immune, you know, to those social forces. So as, you know, everyone is contending with racism in the public sphere, and in terms of state action and state power and what co corporations do, so too, there is a reckoning that needs to take place in science. You know, we want to make sure that there's people at the table making decisions. So who is at the table making decisions, right? Who are the gatekeepers, right? Uh, and I think that's one, one way to, you know, as, as, as a um, mid-career, you know, a scholar, you know, kind of advanced associate professor, you know, I'm at the table when decisions are being made and you know, I, I, I really I welcome that role. Um, and with having a seat at that table, um, I'd like to ask you, what things would you change or think need to be changed within the industry for the betterment of Black colleagues of the next generation and the progression of those currently navigating their careers? Mm. You know, I think we're at a very interesting moment because on the, and it's a moment filled with a certain tension or contradiction. On the one hand, you have a small class of um, elite, well-trained scientists of color, and they have, you know, through struggle and through sacrifice and through you know, being positioned in the right networks have risen to positions of power and they're highly visible. And in their visibility, they become both target uh, and, you know, um, an object to be consumed, right? Oh, look at all the lovely black scientists we have. Look at, you know, look at the work they're doing. There's a certain kind of perform performance 
to diversification, a performance to justice that can make it seem like just because we've got these bodies here, the problem is solved. So the visibility of those people does not necessarily mean that the structural conditions that underlie that, that, that representation have changed. The other thing I would say is uh, about resources. It's been amazing to get a, a small glimpse into the vast sums of resources that are mobilized by universities um, to support their scientists. Um, you know, setting up labs, for example, right? Making massive investments in equipment and technology. Um, and those investments aren't always equitably distributed. What advice would you give black graduates that are entering um, your field of STEM, such as sociology? My uh, dissertation advisor, um, uh, her name was Patricia Hill Collins, gave me lots of sage advice about how to navigate um, different points in my career, one of which she, she you know, was pretty, pretty simple, but she said to stay mobile, right? That always keep my, my resume and my CV ready to go, right? Keep accruing currency in case I needed to, to move. That the, the conditions for black scholars in the United States are such that you know, conditions might change and you might need to find a new job. The other counsel I would give um, is to, um, we are in these institutions, but not necessarily of them. And we didn't design them and they weren't designed for us. And in some ways, until we can redesign, we can reconfigure to create space for ourselves in the work that we do, I think we are in this kind of insider-outsider relationship to science that kind of defines how the, our conversation, right? I'm both in it and just somehow not fully of it um, quite yet. Do you have any role models that inspired your career? Oh, there have been so many. I mentioned Dr. Collins. Um, who, you know, for many people, you know, stands as an exemplar of a serious uh, and a brilliant scholar whose work um, stands, speaks for itself. The quality of the work speaks for itself. And I learned an extraordinary amount from Dr. Collins and remain grateful to her. I'll mention one other person that, you know, who well, I think I kind of credit with pushing me toward grad school. And her name was Dr. Claire Sturck. Um, and Claire Sturck uh, is the now retired president of Emory University in Atlanta. And she asked me um, if I wanted to work on someone else's research project my whole life or if I wanted my own. And, you know, the kind of ego, the, e the egotistical kind of, you know, a part of me was like, I, I would like to do my own. And so, um, you know, I credit her with you know, steering me in that direction at that time. And you know, she continued to support me you know, in different ways over the years. And so I credit both of them for, both of these women, extraordinary scholars, for helping me get my feet in, in this world um, and for training me so well, but also for teaching me an ethic of, of reciprocity and an ethic of mentoring that um, supports me to this day. I'd like to ask you um, if you have any black inventors um, that you that are a favorite of yours and if they have any stories that resonated with you? There, there are many great examples. The one that's most present for me right now is Henry Box Brown. Uh, and not, not a new classic inventor in the same sense that we might think of a scientist inventor, but a creative inventor. Uh, Henry Box Brown was an enslaved man who shipped himself to freedom in a box, traded himself up and shipped himself to freedom and you know, after you know, emerging from this box, uh, you know, took on an identity and a career as a performer, as an abolitionist, as an educator, um, you know, and used this story of his his boxing himself to freedom, shipping himself to freedom, um, uh, to great effect. Um, thank you for joining us today, Professor Hatch, and being a part of our speaker series. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. And to all the folks, y'all be well, stay safe, wear your double masks, and I'll see you when the pandemic ends. Absolutely. Stay safe. Thank you.